Well, I finished Manchester United nil, Liverpool 3 in the big Premier League game this afternoon on Off the Ball. I was on commentary duties alongside Keith Tracy with me here. Uh, Keith, would you say it was a shock result? No, I wouldn't say it was a shock result. Um, I did expect United to compete an awful lot better than they did. Um, some of the mistakes they made, uh, playing out from the back, Casemiro, Martinez, these are... You know, these are boys who've been around. They know how to how to play games. They know how to win games. And when you're at home, and I, I, I get you want to play through the tours, you want to try and open Liverpool up. But when you make mistake after mistake, and Liverpool have threatened once or twice to hit the back of the net because you've been caught playing out from the back, I think as a player, you need to start saying, right, we need to turn Liverpool for a while here. Okay, we might not get anything from it, but we're not going to give Liverpool anything. And Liverpool's press just got better and better. They got after Manchester United and Casemiro was really, really underwhelming in the first half. Gave the ball away. Kobe Mainu gave the ball away for Diaz a second goal. So United just making mistake after mistake after mistake. Really poor in the wings. I thought if United were going to do anything today, Rashford would have to be outstanding. Garnacho would have to be outstanding. Fernandez, the same, and, and Zerxi up front. Zerxi probably missed two chances that he put it an awful lot better with. But you know, I, I think Liverpool got their, got their heads in front, 3 0 up, and they thought. That'll do us and really didn't step on the throat of Manchester United because that could have been worse for them. There was a lot of talk about Casemiro rediscovering his form that he produced when he wor- first signed for United. Um, that didn't seem to be anywhere on that pitch today. No, and the one criticism I've always been at, well, everybody's been throwing at Casemiro over the last, I don't know what it'd be, six months, maybe a little bit more, is that he looks he looks heavy. He can't get round the pitch and he doesn't seem to be able to get after people and there was once or twice when he was coming out midfield to go and get after people and he was just getting one, two and you're thinking, you can't do that. You have to have a brain in your head. You can't just vacate space and even when he gives the ball away, you're thinking, the, pass, the, the passing channel is there from initially but players will give you the passing channel and as you go to hit it, they will step into it. They'll just dangle that carrot to play and he takes the bait and you can play that pass but you've got to get air on it because that way, if you over hit it, no problem. It's a misplaced pass. If you under hit it and it gets cut out, the, the chances of it ending up in a shot on goal are massive. And look, I've had Sam Allardyce shouting me at me that for years. So I know sideways and backwards passes have to be 100% passes. They have to hit the target. The pass appreciation for Manchester United players from one to the other seems non-existent. They're bouncing balls in knee height into the midfield to young lads like Main who saying, go and deal with that. And you're thinking, pass the ball better to the young lad. And look, they made their own mistakes once or twice, Manchester United, but yeah, you just need to be a little bit clever with things and, and you know you can go out there with the manager having a, a certain game plan but things change and you need you need problem solvers on the fly and again I go back to Martinez I go back to Casemiro Fernandez they don't seem like leaders to me and you need leaders in your Premier League dressing rooms Could there be a case of this United team are going to be okay that it is just the start of the season a lot of new signings coming into the team we had two full debuts in Xerxes and De Ligt you got Masraoui he's coming in there as well um, like, could you give Ten Hag a bit of leeway there and say, look, it's going to take time for this team to knit together? <sighs> you would. You can say, look, he, once he gets Shaw back, once he gets Hoyland back, I think maybe things can start to get a little bit better for them. But given the fact that it was so poor towards the end of last season, and you're thinking they ended up winning the cup and he gets a stay of execution, it needed to hit the ground running. And again, he will point to injuries. I get that. I, I, I've mentioned the Luke Shaw thing a million times. I don't know how a player can be injured at the end of the season and play in the Euros and then come back injured again. Manchester United pays wages, so he shouldn't have played in the Euros. And I think a stronger off the field, uh, if, if you want to say Jim Ratcliffe, if you want to say Eric Ten Hag, whoever it is, should have sat him down and said, look, you're a big, big part of this team. When Luke Shaw doesn't play left back, the levels do come down for Manchester United. When Luke Shaw is fit, he's probably one of the best left-backs in the league. So why United would let him go to the Euros and play? I understand he wants to play for his country, but I think the club has to take it out of his hands and think you're our player and you'll be ready for the, pre- the start of the Premier League rather than you know go and play in the final of the Euros for England. It was a bad decision and you know, it will suffer from it, but they've been poorly ran off the, off the, off the pitch now for a, you know, probably two, three, four years. So it's just coming back to get them. Marcus Rashford again mm. looked poor today for United and there was a sense that supporters were starting to turn against him last season because they weren't happy with his work rate. Again, it looked like he was disinterested. He looked unmotivated today. Is there an issue there between him and the head coach, do you think, between him and Ten Hag? Or 
Is there something that Tim Hag can do to turn Marcus Rashford's form around? It hasn't looked like it so far, anyway. No, it doesn't look like it. Rashford looks so disinterested. And, you know, some of the biggest reactions out of Manchester United crowd today was when he got the ball 1v1, you're thinking, right, go and run at Alexander Arnold. His biggest flaw is defensive uh, situations in 1v1s. But every now and then he would look at it and you think, go on, go for it. And he'd just come back inside and he'd pass it. And he's just passing the, the responsibility to somebody else. And you're thinking, we we manipulate these situations. We get you into one v ones. You need to go and take advantage of it. When Luis Diaz or Salah get one v one, they're running at people. When Rashford gets it, he just looks so low on confidence. And the United crowd are getting on his back. They they want him to run at people. And there was one in the uh, the dying embers of the second half where I think it was Connor Bradley gave him a couple of yards and he just threw one into the six yard box. Just I'm going to throw it in there. Seriously, so gets his head in it. And Allison makes a half decent save. And you're thinking. It's not rocket science. Just put decent balls into the box and the big lad will go and do something. But he looks totally, totally disinterested. And if you have to ask me, I do think he needs to move. You know, sometimes you get into a rut at a club. I know he was very close with Jaden Sancho when he feels like he wasn't wasn't treated too well. So that can that can roll into other players. And, you know, as, a, as an ex-winger, I look at Rashford and I think he can be one of the most exciting players in the Premier League. But he seems to be a million miles off it at the minute. And... When we saw you know, he come out for the second half, he makes the change, takes Casemiro off. I think everybody was expecting that. Brings on a young man, Toby Collier, just 20 years of age. Like such a, an introduction for him to make his senior debut for the club. And it says a lot about United that that was the option they had to turn to in a week when they sold Scott McTominay. I understand the new signing of Garte isn't available just yet, but it doesn't look great either. And when you see the gaps between, we mentioned it during the commentary, the defence and the midfield, is that... Uh, like, do you think Ten Hag had planned that? Is this part of his game plan that leaves them open in that particular area, or is that a case of players not doing what they're being told to do? No, I, I think it has to be an instruction from Ten Hag because if you're a holding midfielder there, if you're Casemiro and you're thinking, right, I'm going to go and push up really high and go and get after McAllister, you're vacating that place in behind you. I mean, I know it's a million miles apart, but when I was heavy and playing in that position, you know the further up the pitch you go, the more exposed you can be behind you. And when Casemiro's going into the opposition half, you're thinking, you can't recover. You haven't got the legs to recover, so do not vacate that space. And it, it, look, Casemiro's obviously been around, he knows the game, so I can't imagine it's him saying, I'm going to get on my bike and run after people, because he hasn't got it in him. So if he can sit there, uh, protect the back four, don't risk the passes like he has been. Just nice, neat, simple play. Win the ball back, give it to somebody else. With Maine, whose legs around him, he probably still could do a little bit for Manchester United. But with Ngarte coming in, you would imagine his uh, his days are numbered. And look, he was flirting with Saudi Arabia at the end of last season. Most Manchester United fans' minds were made up about Casemiro. Then we're being told he's had a really good pre-season. Looks sharp, looks like he's lost a little bit of weight. I don't see it for me. I really don't see it. And you mentioned just a few moments ago, Keith, that... You about the reports around Ten Hag being uh, ready for the chop after the FA Cup final was reported in some reputable newspapers. Um, is he under pressure now? Do you think? Yeah, I, I think he has to be under pressure. And it's like I say, anybody can go and lose to Liverpool. Losing to Liverpool is not the end of the world. You don't press the panic button after that. Liverpool, wonderful football and team. But you look at the likes of Rashford, a homegrown player, the fans love him, but just doesn't look interested whatsoever. Garnacho, really, really poor. Fernandez, the captain. Just, just not there, not showing that bit of bite. Martinez going in and smashing people, you know, just losing his discipline, not not lead more petulance than actually leading anybody. So the bigger players in an attacking sense just haven't been anywhere near it. Defensively, I do, I, I like Maserawi. I think in 1v1 situations look good. The lit gives you a little bit, you think, okay, that's something to build on again. But if they keep making those silly decisions and giving away the ball in their own defensive, uh, in their own defensive tour, it's going to be poor. It's going to be poor. And, and look, you can't make a mistake compounded with another mistake and another one. I know an awful lot of United fans have question marks over the goalkeeper, which is, is not great. They seem to have had them for years now since uh, since Michael van der Sar left. So there's still question marks over them, but I think Eric Ten Hag is under massive, massive pressure. And they have an awful lot of talent, Manchester United, but just don't seem to have any backbone or grit. And I'd say what's really frustrating for United fans is to see Ten Hag have so much time He's brought in so many of his own players. And meantime, in the meantime, Liverpool have changed from Jurgen Klopp, uh, a, an iconic figure at Anfield, like all the great managers there, Bill Shankly, Bob Paisley over the years, bring in this guy, Arne Slot, a relatively unknown to uh, fans of English football, uh, had some decent success in uh, the Eredivisie. 
um, and he's come in and it's been a, a very smooth transition and while their performance against Brentford and Ipswich weren't exactly top class there were flashes today was that their best performance you think under the new manager yeah I thought they were brilliant away from home you know you know what like I say I expected Manchester United to be an awful lot better but a lot, an awful lot of people are highlighting Salah and how good he looks how sharp he looks he does he looks everything Jota love him it's, fe- it's not just when, when Jota gets the ball it's what he does off the ball the way he gets after people and you know those little balls that you chip into the channel he goes after them Salah goes after them Diaz as well Sabotsloy looks better Gravenberch McAllister they seem to have the running power that you need in the middle of the pitch and they've got those nice little angles to go and play with each other so Look, people are concentrating on Salah. Diaz are going hurt you on the other side. Nunes coming in gives you that little bit of difference where you can go direct to him. He's probably a, will get off, caught, get caught offside. Will frustrate you at times, but Liverpool, like, there's not an awful lot wrong with them. I know I was thinking will Arnie slot slot into this team and everything be okay. Maybe lose that chaos that uh, Klopp used to bring, where they would just have 10, 15 minutes of chaos. It seems a little bit more manufactured under them, which is great. Yeah, look, I, I didn't think it would be this smooth for Liverpool, and obviously there are obviously going to be bigger tests ahead, but early signs are really good under Andy Schlott and Liverpool, yeah. Yeah, and it's a different formation as well. He's going more 4 2 3 1 as opposed to the 4 3 3 that Klopp uh, favoured. Has that given them a bit more defensive solidity, or is there a bit more to it, do you think? No, I, I think, yeah, I think there's a, definitely a bit more defensive the solidity delay. Uh, Robertson is staying at home a little bit more, not doing the, the lung bust and loans that we're probably used to over the last couple of years. Trent Alexander Arnold, he's been let off the leash as usual. You go and do it. Alexander, I have, sorry, Robertson will stay at home a little bit more. Van Dijk and Canate, brilliant. And McAllister, he's, when we see him in an Argentinian short, you think, get him in the number 10. He's one of the best in the world there. You see him playing for Liverpool that little bit deeper. Probably not his best position, but does a really good job. And Gravenberch is getting better with every game he's playing. And again, you're thinking you want Gravenberch a little bit further up the pitch. They seem to be absolutely brilliant where they are. And them three with Sabotsloy, they can interchange. Like one can say, I'm going to go, you you go and mind the house. And yeah, the, the communication, the understanding seems an awful lot better at Liverpool than it does at, say, Manchester United. And is there anything else about this particular Liverpool team under slot, the way they're playing? Anything else that's impressed you so far? Oh, I think it's just you know it's 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 common sense football. They don't uh, they don't lose the ball too much. Van Dijk and Ate don't take too many risks. Alexander Arnold, as we say, will be allowed off the off the leash, but Robertson will come make it a back three at times. And Diaz Salah, really really good. And like I, like I say, a lot of people have question marks over Nunes, but being an ex winger, when you've got that out ball, when you don't really need to look, you just chip it into a certain area. He will run after it and cause problems. He's somebody that players like to play with, although he can be frustrating. So. Yeah, look, I, I think Liverpool, I still think Manchester City are just up there. They front the life out of me. Yesterday, uh, where Haaland's hat-trick looks so, so sharp. But, yeah, I think Arsenal, Liverpool, just behind Manchester City. United, can you see them finishing top four this season? No, absolutely no chance. I think if they were to finish the eighth again this season, I think it'd be about right. Look, a lot of things can happen. A lot of injuries. Europe, is, uh, as we round the bend at, cr- at Christmas coming into January, we'll know a little bit more. But Manchester United, for me, early signs all over the place. And Liverpool with those Champions League fixtures as well to look forward to. Um, is it top four will be success, do you think, for Arne Slot this season? Or is there a chance he might be feeling he can pip City to the, the title at the end of the year? Um, no, I, I think he, he will have... He will want the title race in his head. Whether or not he can actually give us that, I'm not too sure. But look, four season coming in, very, very high standard with Manchester City and Arsenal setting the bar so, so high. I think if Liverpool can stick around, you know, give us a bit of a race with Europe coming in as well, it's going to be difficult for them. I just don't see anybody matching Manchester City squad. I was looking at their bench uh, yesterday against West Ham. It really does make your make you know, mouth water. So, look, Manchester City still strong favourites for me. Liverpool, Arsenal capable of an upset, but over 38 games, it's going to be really difficult for them. Just to ask you finally as well, obviously, Ireland's are going to be playing against England and Greece in the upcoming uh, international window in the Nations League. Uh, the squad, not too many, uh, I suppose, players in there that were surprising. Um, McAteer obviously called in after getting his uh, Irish passport sorted out. Uh, it, it, the England game looks like it's going to be a, a mountain to climb for an Irish team under a head coach that only had them, he said himself, on the pitch maybe three times before the game itself. So not a lot of time for him to plan. Um, what did you make about his comments there? I won't repeat the word that he <laughs> used, but maybe to use a John Giles phrase, a player that would kill his granny. Can you see any yeah. players in that Irish squad? 
Yeah, uh, well, I, I was looking at Jason Malumbi in pre-season. He, w- he was doing a bit of UFC <laughs> training. So, look, at Malumbi, there is a couple in there that will go in and put that foot in. We do have a couple of those players, but the one player we need is somebody who gets on the half turn and can open open teams up defensively. I think we're solid. I think we can play three centre-halves, two wing-backs. Seamus Coleman, Matt Doherty out there. It looks good. Of Benny Schmodix, Ferguson, I'm not too sure what's going on with his injury, but Adam Eda up at Celtic as well. The front four, front six, we can cause problems, but I think the blueprint for Irish team moving, moving forward is keep clean sheets and go and nick what you can get. It's going to be really difficult against the English, against the Greeks. We know how good the Greeks are. We all know how good the English are. But I think if we can go there, be hard to be, make people coming to Lansdowne Road thinking they don't want to be here, then that's the blueprint for our success. And look, I, I think with the Nations League we have, I think this will probably just be a write-off and we need to just start getting tuned into Euro 2028. I know it's a long way away for footballers, but we're hosting the tournament and we don't want to be stood on the sidelines watching it. So that's the one for me, Euro 2028. Keith Tracy, thanks a million. Cheers.